Hi, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you very much. And I wanted to thank you, Kier, for your comments earlier, illustrating uh, uh, the words of another founder of the Hebrew University, that time is relative. <laughs> um, I'll start with this sketch, which I drew about a month after the attacks of September 11. And it, you know, because I'm here among New Yorkers, and I think all of us remember that day and our reaction to that day. And for me as an architect, the way to react, the way to respond was to, to start sketching. And I sketched an idea of a memorial in the Hudson River. I couldn't imagine actually um, building anything at the site at the time. It was a six-story high pile of rubble that was burning. And so I was drawn to the Hudson River nearby and this notion of coming to the edge of Manhattan, coming to that threshold, and looking beyond at, um, at the river and these two voids forming, appearing in the river and water falling into these voids, but all this water flowing into them would never fill them up, that sense of ongoing absence. I wanted to, to make that absence visible, to make that sense of ongoing loss visible. And so I took this sketch and eventually over the course of a year, I ended up building a small fountain, a small sculpture that captured that idea of the surface of water sort of torn open, forming these two voids. And I took that little fountain and I put it on the rooftop of my apartment building in the East Village where I had seen the second plane crash into the South Tower. And I photographed it against the skyline, imagining the, the absence of those two towers in the skyline mirrored and reflected in these two voids in the foreground. And I did this over the course of a year. It was very much a self-directed sort of cathartic exercise that I felt I came to completion when I put that, that sculpture up on the roof. And I set it aside. And I came back to it a year later, following the selection of a master plan for the site by Daniel Liebskin, which took the 16-acre site and subdivided it into four unequal quadrants, setting aside eight acres, the largest quadrant where the towers had once stood, for a memorial, and you can see that on the top left corner of the screen there. But the Leapskin Master Plan suggested um, both renewal and memory. It brought back five office towers to the site, which you see here, surrounding the area where the memorial would be. But the Master Plan also suggested that the memorial would be cut off from the everyday life of the city, that it would be in this deep, pit in the middle of the city, some eight acres in size, and you would go down a long ramp, descending some initially 60 feet and then 30 feet to arrive at the memorial. And I thought about my own experiences here in New York um, in the days that followed 9-11 and how important public space was and the democratic values and virtues which are inherent in public space to the response of New York as a city. I think um, Churchill said, you know, we design, we build our buildings and then they build us. Um, it's the same thing with public space and nothing is more fundamental, I think, to, to the values of democracy, of society, than public space. It is there where we stand side by side with strangers and come together as a community. And we did that here in New York, at humble street corners, at places like Washington Square and Union Square. And it was, for me, a moment where I became a New Yorker. I had been living here for three years, but I felt very much like an Israeli living in New York. And then in an instant, it was as if I was back in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, but I was here at home in New York. And uh, that, the ability to connect to the city, to connect to strangers, to me, came from the ability to stand side by side by people at places like Washington Square. And so when I saw this, design, I thought, it's completely wrong. It cuts it off from the life of the city when what we should do is make it part of the life of the city. And I thought, let's bring everything up to grade and create a big open park, a public and civic plaza. And I thought of the idea of the two voids which had been in the river. And I thought, could I bring them here to the site of the towers to mark their footprints? And you can see that sketch of the memorial plaza bounded on West Street, Church, Greenwich, and um, I'm sorry, Greenwich, Liberty, Fulton, and West. And this was the submission that I sent in. It was an open competition back in 2003. Some 5,200 people sent their submission. It was an anonymous competition. It was a 30 by 40 inch board. And on this board, I suggested this idea of a plaza um, at grade with these two pools. 
But in doing so, we also created a lot of space below this urban plaza. What would have been an open pit now became the site for a museum, for an underground road network, for um, everything, both make, you know, both the mechanical needs, but also the spiritual needs of the site, a museum uh, to commemorate the events. But all of that complexity is hidden and underneath you. When you stand on the Memorial Plaza, it's as if you're standing on firm ground. You're in the middle of the city, surrounded by buildings. The same way that if you go out to Central Park across the street, you'll see the wall of Fifth Avenue and Central Park West and forming this big urban room, the same sense here, that sense of a large space for gathering. And I showed this to a number of people for a while, and I, this photograph that I took, um, it took somebody to point it out to me that in it, they saw my project. This is one of the cutoff columns, the steel columns, which had once supported the World Trade Center, and it had been torch cut in the recovery effort, leaving a clear trace of the violence that had occurred at this site, of what had been here and is no longer. And you could put another steel column here, but I think in doing so, you would have erased the memory of that day. What was more important was to, to hint at the absence, to make that absence visible, to let people connect to it and see the absence. And that is, in essence, what the memorial is about. It's about being able to look back and, and see what is no longer there. Another big part of the memorial are the names. I think more than anything else, the way the names appear on the memorial are the touchstone, the thing that matters most to so many people. And it was a matter of enormous debate and impassioned um, disagreements. But to family members who lost loved ones, it was the most important thing about the memorial. And when I first proposed this idea of meaningful adjacencies, it seemed incredibly complex. And the LMDC, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, rejected it out of hands. The idea was to reach out to family members and ask them, who else among the dead would you like to see inscribed next to the person that you lost, to allow that web of connections between people who passed away that day to manifest itself in some hidden and invisible way in the arrangement of the names. And for two years, that issue sort of created so much controversy because we couldn't agree on what to do. And there were proposals from family members to list people by employer and by tower and by floor, listing them alphabetically, as you see in the top of the screen. And I thought that even something as simple as the graphic arrangement of the names, putting them in columns, was completely different than letting each name stand alone by itself as part of a constellation. And you see on the bottom this idea of staggering the names, giving each name a geographic place on the memorial that belonged to it. And we looked long and hard at this. We looked at the, the sort of the design part of it, like would the letters be raised or would they be recessed? Would they be floating in water or not? Um, and we spent a lot of time on that side of the equation, the sort of the, the pure design side of the equation. But what was more important to me and took more work but was absolutely important was to get, bring this idea to fruition, this idea of meaningful adjacencies. And in 2006, when Mayor Bloomberg became chairman of the Memorial Foundation, uh, he wanted to revisit this issue and find a way to resolve all of the controversy that surrounded the names arrangement. And he was willing to, to give us a chance uh, to try an idea that was untested, that could have had catastrophic um, consequences, and unlike most politicians who um, would never do this, he said, go for it. And so letters went out to family members, finally, asking them to verify the spelling of the name of the loved one, how they would like their name to appear, but also what other names would they like to see next to the person that they lost. And we received over 1,200 requests back. And the statistician hired by the Memorial Foundation told us that there was zero chance we would be able to meet all of these requests. Um, but we spent close to a year arranging these names and it seemed providential when we were finally able to do that. We were able to respond to every request in a way that arranged the names so that every adjacency request was met. And to me that was very important because I think the names are such a touchstone of this memorial. And for people who lost loved ones, when they come to the memorial and see, you know, the two shades next to each other, it's meaningful to them. But it's also meaningful to us when we walk up to the memorial and we find out by different means some of the, re the stories behind these requests. One of the requests we got was from a young woman who lost her father 
on Flight 11 and her best friend from college who was working in the North Tower. And so his name and her name are side by side. And nobody really knows that other than them. But there are ways to share that story with everybody else. And when you hear the story of loss that this one woman suffered, it's a way for you to relate to it on a very personal basis, a way to empathize and understand um, in a way that hearing a number like close to 3,000 dead fails to communicate. Um, and I think it's something that over time, once that meaning is embedded in the memorial, it can, it can come out in different means, whether it's an audio guide or an app or a video guide or a printed brochure or whatever it is, there are ways to tell these stories. And I think telling these stories is incredibly important and part of what we should be doing here. So here are some images of the names and people. This was on the day the memorial was dedicated. And everything that we did up until that point was really half of the equation. It was about bringing people together at the site that was so important. And you know, over time, you know, things changed, but some things remain constant in the design. And here is a memorial at night, within the letter is glowing through. And during the day, where you can see the shadows, which are inscribed by the material that has been removed, forming these names. Um, and this picture was taken on the day the memorial was dedicated, as was this, and this too. And for me, it's important to bring that full circle to the site, to bring life and memory together here, because I think it is a site that will be a living part of New York City. And these things are not in, in contradiction to one another, they support one another. So, thank you. I'd be happy to, say, to take some questions. There were many different suggestions for the memorial, and over the course that I was involved in the project um, until its dedication in uh, 2011, I had to contend with a lot of questions. Well, what if we did this, or could we add that? And there were a lot of strong and positive ideas, but I felt that in an odd way, the, the vision that I had outlined to the jury in 2000 and three, 2004, was something I was beholden to. It was a promise that I, I made. And I tried to find ways to, to respond to some of the suggestions, requests, and demands that I got. And one of them very much had to do with inclusion of sort of artifacts, like the fire trucks, the, the, the globe, uh, that were um, sort of physical symbols of, of the events of that day that had captured people's um, imaginations and feelings. Um, but I also knew that I couldn't accommodate every request that came that way to, to me. And some of these artifacts are going to be housed in the Memorial Museum, which came about as a result of bringing that plaza up to grade and creating a, a museum that's over 100,000 square feet below us. And that museum will be dedicated this coming spring. Um, but other requests I couldn't meet. And, uh, but I always tried to find a way to, to hear where that request came from, where the concern that underlied a request came from, and to see if we could respond in some way in the memorial. And there are many facets of the memorial that changed over time, but I had to keep true to the overall uh, direction that I thought was, was right for this memorial. And I should have said first thing that um, both my parents went to Hebrew University, not just my father. <laughs> Thank you. The museum. No. Have you been involved at all in the design of the museum uh, no. or other 9 11 memorials? No, neither. I sort of, the design that I proposed created the space for the museum. It's very much defined. The ceiling of that museum is the memorial plaza. And, you know, you have five feet of soil and then the ceiling of the museum below us. And, you know, Daniel Liebskin very much was moved by the, the slurry wall that was exposed and the recovery effort, which basically excavated the site 
60 feet down, and he talked of bedrock. The bedrock was actually the lowest foundation slab, the lowest basement slab. And so I wanted to find a way to, to preserve access to that wall, but not in the open air, but within the museum. And so I feel like I've had uh, an early role in designing the museum, but I've not been involved in the design of the exhibits or what is in it. Do you realize, I'm sure you do realize that for many families, they don't even have any DNA that was buried anywhere. Um, is there any place, because they consider that basically the cemetery? Absolutely. That is one of the reasons why the names arrangement to me was so critical, because I didn't want the, I wanted the name to be the geographical marker. And if you go to a cemetery, a cemetery is not organized alphabetically, obviously. Every person has a physical place in the cemetery. And so there were a lot of suggestions. The names should be organized alphabetically. And that went, in my mind, right against that notion of giving each person a place at the site that belonged to them, a physical and geographic place. Thank you. Could you please repeat the question? Yeah, the question was, how did I feel when I first saw the design realized? And um, you know, architecture is a very slow uh, uh, business, so it took a long time. And you got to see it slowly taking uh, shape. And I have been privileged to go to the memorial ceremonies every year on the 11th. And I remember the first year when that ceremony was no longer 60 feet below street level but up at street level. And being able to see the rest of New York all of a sudden felt like a really important moment. I mean, that seems like, it might seem like a trivial thing, but to just where you're standing relative to everything else around you made a, made a big difference. Um, I've been back to see the memorial quite a few times since its dedication. And only recently have I been able to kind of like step back and, and really see it, you know, it's like every time previous to that, you're, like, you're looking at, you know, that joint should be a quarter of an inch, not three-eighths of an inch, you know, or that tree, is, you know, should be moved over five feet, because, things like that, so, but I was able to just see people at the memorial and to see how, you know, comfortable seems like the wrong word, but people feel at home when they're there, and to me that's very important, that it, you know, that it's a place where people are at ease with themselves and each other, but not in a way that, you know, it's not like they're relaxing on the beach, but they're, but they're not, you know, sort of held back. They, are, they can connect to it emotionally. And to me, that, it's as if we've built a, a moment of silence, and what people do in that moment of silence, how they occupy it in their thoughts is what, what I hope happens there.